I'm a big fan of electricity. Does anybody else like electricity? When's the last time you took some time to think about all the things that run on electricity? It's, a, it's amazing. Actually, we were, um, when we were on holiday, we were at a place where electricity was minimal. There was some there, but it was minimal. And it was just striking to me how dependent we've become on electricity. It uses all kind, we use it for all sorts of things. And uh, one of the things that I marvel at when I think about electricity is the system that we have for delivering electricity to our homes. It's absolutely fascinating. I won't take time to explain how the whole electricity grid works. I'm not sure I totally understand it myself. Um, but, but parts of it are absolutely fascinating. Uh, the really high voltage portions of the electrical grid caught my attention many years ago when I saw a video of someone doing maintenance on a hydro line that had three quarters of a million volts on the line. That's how much voltage was there. Um, to put that in perspective, your house has 240 volts in it, and this guy was, was maintaining a line with three quarters of a million volts. The, the video starts with him riding on the platform that's attached to the edge of a helicopter. And he gives a bit of electrical theory at the beginning of the video how it's possible for him to do what he's about to do. And a few minutes after explaining what's happening, he's sitting there, there's a camera shot of him on the platform, and he's holding a wand, a metal wand, in his hand from the helicopter, and he reaches it towards the three-quarters of a million volts. And because that's such a high voltage, the electricity actually jumps the gap. There's a bit of a, like a, light, a small lightning bolt from the hydro line to the wand until he makes it uh, completely touch the, the, the electricity line. And then he puts, once that's touched, he puts a clamp on it. And then he puts some other clamps and he puts some, a pulley system on. And then he gets off the platform and he's on the wires. And he crawls along the wires to get to the place to do the maintenance. And then when he's done the maintenance, he crawls back and the whole process is reversed and he gets back on the helicopter. I had two simultaneous thoughts when I saw the video. Number one, that looks really cool. And number two, that looks really dangerous. Uh, he tells a joke at the end of the video. He says, I'm only afraid of three things in life. There's only three things I've ever been afraid of. Heights electricity, and women. <laughs> and then he finishes the video off by saying, and I'm married too. Um, and the thing that stuck out in the video for me was when he, he, he says this phrase, you know, people often ask me, uh, you know, do, do you think that what you do is dangerous? And he says, he points out in the video that everything they do is extremely well thought out and rehearsed before they do it in order to make the job as safe as possible. He says it's not a job for careless people. You need to do things according to the plan in order to stay safe. That's the kind of image that comes to my mind when I think about the people of Israel and the building of the tabernacle. This morning we're looking at Exodus chapter 27. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Exodus chapter 27. And we'll read it together. Exodus chapter 27 and we'll read the entire chapter. Listen to the word of God. It says, build an altar of acacia wood, three cubits high. It is to be square, five cubits long, and five cubits wide. Make a horn at each of the four corners so that the horns and the altar are of one piece. And overlay the altar with bronze. Make all its utensils of bronze, its pots to remove the ashes, and its shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. Make a grating for it a bronze network, and make a bronze ring at each of the four corners of the network. Put it under the ledge of the altar so that it is halfway up the altar. 
Make poles of acacia wood for the altar and overlay them with bronze. The poles are to be inserted into the rings so they will be on the two sides of the altar when it is carried. Make the altar hollow out of boards. It is to be made just as you were shown on the mountain. Make a courtyard for the tabernacle. The south side shall be a hundred cubits long, and it, and it is to have curtains of finely twisted linen, with twenty posts and twenty bronze bases, with silver hooks and bands on the posts. The north side shall also be a hundred cubits long, and is to have curtains with twenty posts and twenty bronze bases, bases and with silver hooks and bands on the posts." The west end of the courtyard shall be 50 cubits wide and have curtains with 10 posts and 10 bases. On the east end, toward the sunrise, the courtyard shall also be 50 cubits wide. Curtains 15 cubits long are to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three bases. And curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side with three posts and three bases. For the entrance to the courtyard, Provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer with four posts and four bases. All the posts around the courtyard are to have silver bands and hooks and bronze, and bronze bases. The courtyard shall be 100 cubits long and 50 cubits wide, with curtains of finely twisted linen, five cubits high, with bronze bases. All the other articles used in the service of the tabernacle, whatever their function, including all the tent pegs for it and those for the courtyard, are to be of bronze. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light, so that the lamps may be kept burning in the tent of meeting, outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony. Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning, This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for the generations to come. In this chapter of God's Word, we read about the construction of the altar, and we read about the construction of the courtyard, and we also read about the oil that the Israelites are supposed to continually bring to the Lord. Now, what makes the courtyard different from the actual tabernacle, from the tent, is that the people of Israel are actually allowed to come in to the courtyard. And so what we have in, in, in this picture in, in Exodus 27, what was that? Was that anything? Did you hear that? Am I hearing things? Okay. So I'm not crazy. Something was done, but I have no idea what it was. We'll just carry on. So what we have in Exodus chapter 27 is we have a picture of people approaching God's presence. Right? God said to the people in the last couple chapters that we looked at that he make this tabernacle and I'm going to dwell there. My presence is going to be there. So, so now we're in the courtyard and we have this picture of people approaching the presence of of God. And as we look through this chapter of the building of the altar and the courtyard and the oil offerings, there's some important lessons for those of us who desire to draw close to God. Number one is this. People can only approach God through sacrifice. Hebrews 9.22. You may know it. It says this. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And without forgiveness of sin, there is no access to God. People can only approach God through sacrifice. Chapter 27 begins with this instruction. God says to Moses, tell the people to build an altar now an altar, if you, if you know your Bibles, you know that an altar is the place where sacrifices are offered to the Lord. God says in this case to make a square table, make it seven and a half feet long and seven and a half feet wide, and it's to be four and a half feet tall. And in each of the four corners, there's supposed to be a horn that appears, and the horn is to be of, made of one piece with the altar. Now, an animal's horn in the Bible 
represents strength and power. When the Lord gives instructions to Moses concerning sacrifices, you'll find that in many of the sacrifices that we'll see that God commands, that the priest is to take some of the blood from the sacrifice, and he's supposed to go to the altar, and he's supposed to put some of the blood on each one of the four horns. It's a means, and and God says this is a means by which sin or impurity is cleansed. Carl Kyle, the commentator, argues that since the horn is a symbol of power or strength and the blood of the sacrifices is to be placed on the horns, then the horns likely represent, why put horns on the altar? It represents the power of the altar to deal with sin. In addition to the altar itself, there are the utensils that are described here in verse 3. Look at verse 3. We see that there's a number of utensils. He says, make all the utensils out of bronze. It's pots to remove the ashes. It's shovels, sprinkling bowls, meat forks, and fire pans. Ash Ash pots, shovels, and fire pans tell us that on the altar there's going to be fire, and that's a significant part of what takes place on the altar. According to verse 8, the altar is to be hollow. That is, it's to be a frame with nothing in the center. Some commentators think that what happened was that the hollow frame was then filled with dirt so that a fire could be built for the sacrifices. And other commentators think that the grating that's mentioned here, there's, there's grating that's mentioned that's to be attached to the altar, forms kind of like a, a shelf of bronze, a bronze grate to act as sort of like a barbecue to have the burnt offerings on the altar. Either way, whether it's filled with dirt or whether the grate is used for the fire, Moses is told to build the altar in such a way as is shown him on the mountain. So God is very specific about how the altar is to be built, and he's shown Moses on the mountain what it's supposed to look like. And if Moses and the Israelites will build the altar according to the way that is shown him on the mountain, and if they'll offer the required sacrifices, then they might they may be able to dwell in the courtyard. They, they can enter into, or approach rather, the presence of God where he's dwelling. That access comes by way of the altar, by way of sacrifice. This year my driver's license is up for renewal. It's, uh, it's a bit of a weird year. I don't know if uh, any of you, if whether your licenses are expired, they're actually letting people drive around these days without expired licenses or with expired licenses so that the MTO won't get clogged up. But in a normal year, if, if everything was normal and your license was due for renewal, you would head down to the N- MTO and get your picture taken, right? Uh, how many of you like your driver's license picture? They, they always turn out fabulous. I mean, it's the best, they're the greatest pictures. Uh, when you get your driver's license picture. And then, and then you fill out the paperwork, you pay your money, and you get your driver's license, right? And one of the purposes of a valid driver's license is to show, if, if, if you need to, um, I'm sure none of you would ever get pulled over by the police, but every now and again, if, if someone was to get pulled over by the police, what do they ask for? They show your driver's license, Right? And a driver's license is a way, it's a quick way for you to show that you've done all the things that you need to do. You've paid all the money, you've taken all the tests, you've done all the requirements so that you get the privilege of driving a car. Well, the altar in the, in the courtyard of the tabernacle is a place where the Israelites were to go to show themselves as those that belong to the Lord and therefore have the privilege of approaching the place of his dwelling. As Christians, we don't look to the altar of Exodus 27. We don't look to the sacrifices of animals to approach the Lord. Instead, we look to the altar of Calvary. We look to the cross of Christ. Matthew Henry, the great commentator, has an interesting comparison between the altar and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
noting that the altar is made of wood and then overlaid with bronze or brass, as the old commentators used to say, he writes this, the wood would have been consumed by the fire if it had not been secured by the brass. Nor could the human nature of Christ have borne the wrath of God if it had not been supported by a divine power. Jesus' perfect humanity, this is one of the incomprehensible truths that we are faced with at the cross. Jesus' perfect humanity, that the fact that he never sinned, he perfectly obeyed God, gives him the ability to stand in our place as a true and good sacrifice. And his divinity gives him the capacity to bear the fullness of God's infinite wrath which he justly pours out against our sin. Jesus bore that on our behalf. In the Old Testament, we read of a few occasions where people would flee to the altar and they would take hold of the horns in an effort to save their life. They would flee to it as a, as a place of refuge. And that is the exhortation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters, that we would run to the cross of Christ. That is our altar, that we would flee to the cross of Christ and desperately cling to it by faith, trusting that His sacrifice has the power to save us and His blood the power to make us clean so that we might approach the throne of Almighty God. The altar is a constant reminder to the people of God that approaching the Lord requires sacrifice. Not just any sacrifice. It's the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus upon the cross that marks the way into the presence of God. That narrow way is illustrated for us when we read of the description of the courtyard that's built here in chapter 27 and verses 9 through 19. And the way the courtyard is constructed here makes this second point about approaching God very clear. There is only one way to approach God. The Lord never changes, never changes to suit the desires of humanity. The idea that God finds value or worth in all the religions or all the faiths of the world is completely contrary to his nature, to who he truly is. He does not find worth in all the religions of the world. There is one way, only one way to approach God. As we read verses 9 through 19, there's a number of things that stand out in the description of the courtyard. It's a rectangle. It's a giant rectangle. It's 150 feet long, and it's 75 feet wide, and it completely encloses the tabernacle that is within its borders. We're told here that the curtains for the courtyard are made seven and a half feet high, which is half the height of the tabernacle. So if we were part of the Israelite community, if we were camping around the tabernacle and we looked at the border of the courtyard, we could see the tabernacle. It would be taller than the curtains that make the border of the courtyard. We could see it. But what's clear here is that there is a border, seven and a half feet tall, there's a border that cannot be crossed. There's a demarcation, there's a distinction between the dwelling place of God and the rest of the world. Some theologians think that this barrier of distinction is an important reminder for the church. They rightly point out that God reveals himself to be utterly distinct, utterly different from the fallen world. And so there ought to be some kind of discernible difference. If God is different from the world, there ought to be some kind of discernible difference between God's people and the world. If the church's priority is to accommodate the world in hopes of attracting people, then it very quickly loses sight of the goal of pointing people to the Lord. God is not like the world. 
And if you want to come to him, you need to come out of the world, not continue to be a part of it. Well, the boundary is put up around the tabernacle that makes a clear distinction between where God is dwelling and, and the rest of the world. There's an entrance that's made. There's an entrance that's made. It's described here in verses 13 to 16. Listen, on the east end, towards the sunrise, the courtyard shall also be 50 cubits wide. Curtains 15 cubits wide are to be on one side of the entrance with three posts and three basins, and curtains 15 cubits long are to be on the other side with three posts and three bases. For the entrance, there's an entrance here, there's a door. For the entrance to the courtyard, provide a curtain 20 cubits long of blue, purple, and scarlet yarn, and finely twisted linen, the work of an embroiderer with four posts and four bases. So on the entrance side of the courtyard, there is 22 and a half feet of curtain, regular curtain that's just like the whole courtyard all the way around. And on the right side, there is 22 and a half feet of regular curtain, just like the whole tabernacle. And then right in the middle of that side of the, of the courtyard, which is the east side, there is 30 feet of fine linen, we're told, adorned with the colors of divinity, blue, adorned with the colors of royalty, purple, adorned with the colors of atonement, scarlet or red. And there is only one entrance, and that entrance stands out in beauty and in worth. It's also important to note the side that the entrance is on. That's very important. I said it a couple times, just point it out again. Notice in verse 13, we're told the side of the tabernacle that the entrance is to be on. Do you see it there at the beginning of verse 13? It's to be on the east side. It's on the east side that people are to enter the court, the courtyard. And if you remember from the last couple chapters, you'll remember what side was the entrance to the tent on. It was also on the east side. And it's almost certain that when the priests were to walk into the tent and they were to look at the most holy place where the Ark of the Covenant was going to be placed, that the entrance to the Holy of Holies was also on the east side. So this is the picture. When you're an Israelite, you come into the courtyard facing the west because it's on the east side. So you're facing the west and you come in and you see the altar and what you see in front of you is the tabernacle with the door. And if you were a priest and able to walk through that door, you would see then the most holy and you see another door on the east side, all going in one direction. Why is it on the east side? Why is the entrance to the courtyard and the tabernacle and the holy holies on the east side? Well, if you go back to Genesis 3.24, after Adam and Eve got kicked out of the garden, you remember they got kicked out of the garden? What did God place outside of the garden to block the way to the tree of life? Do you remember? There were angels called cherubim and a flaming sword that blocks the way. Guess which side of the garden that was on? It was on the east side. And just like there was one way to the tree of life, to the presence of God that was blocked by the angels, so too we see in the building of the tabernacle. There is one way, but the way through the altar is open. Or at least it's pointing to how God is going to open the way. There's one way into the presence of God. A number of years ago, Michelle and I were fixing up our first house and we decided to replace our bathroom cabinet. And uh, if you know me, you know when I take stuff out of the box and, and, and I'm going to assemble something like that, I always follow the instructions step by step. Always. And that's what I did. I followed the instructions step by step. And when I got to the end, <laughs> it was like the second last piece or the very last piece that had to go together. And when I got to the end, I realized that it wouldn't fit. And the reason why it wouldn't fit is because I had put a piece way back in step number one or two, I had put a piece in backwards. 
There was only one way for that piece to go in. Now, I like when things only have one way that they can be assembled, that there's only one way they can possibly fit. That's the way it is with the Lord. He has been abundantly clear that there is one way to approach Him. All of you probably know Jesus' words in John 14, 6, where He says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And just so there's no mistake, just so there's no understanding, He adds to that, and no one comes to the Father except through Me. Jesus is the curtain. Why is the curtain here different than the rest of the courtyard? The rest of the courtyard is there's, there's, they're, they're made of fine linen, yes, but when you get to the entrance, it's adorned with blue and purple and scarlet, and it's the work of an embroiderer. It, it stands out, the entrance, in beauty and in worth. Jesus is the curtain. He's the gate, and He's the only entrance into the presence of God. Now, I know full well that's not a popular thing to say in our day, but to say otherwise would be unloving and it would be untrue. Unbelievers will try and say to you that if you believe Jesus is the only way, then you're narrow-minded or you're hateful for declaring that there's only one way to God. But the truth is, the truth is, when we do that, we are simply affirming the unique glory and worth of our Lord. We cannot deny who Jesus clearly demonstrated Himself to be. We cannot diminish His saving work by saying there's something else that is just as good. It would be a terrible thing. Would you not agree? It would be a terrible thing to give someone poison and tell them it's good medicine. How much worse to give them false religion. Only Jesus is truly man and truly God. Only Jesus has made a perfect sacrifice for you. So only Jesus, and only Jesus has conquered the grave. And so only Jesus can open the way for you and I to approach the throne of grace. Now you might ask, what will I find there when I approach the Lord by faith in Christ? That's the third lesson that our text gives us. First, people can only approach God through sacrifice. Second, there's only one way to approach God. And third, in approaching God, people find light and life. Most people will agree that our world is full of bad stuff, but disagree on what to do about it. The truth is, is that only the Lord offers a genuine solution to it all. In approaching God, we find light and life. At the end of this chapter, which is focused upon the courtyard, we find something related to the inside of the tabernacle. What's said in verses 20 and 21 serve as a bit of a transition from the description of building the things of the tabernacle to talking about Aaron and his son serving as priests inside the tent of meeting. But it's also a wonderful picture to God's people about what the presence of the Lord will do for them. Let's look together at verses 20 and 21 here. Command the Israelites to bring you clear oil of pressed olives for the light so that the lamps may be kept burning in the tent of meeting outside the curtain that is in front of the testimony. Aaron and his sons are to keep the lamps burning before the Lord from evening till morning. This is to be a lasting ordinance among the Israelites for generations to come. So the people here are told to bring clear olive oil to the tabernacle for the lamps of the sanctuary. The word clear there is really important. Olive oil in the ancient world was extracted from the olives in a couple of different methods. And the method that's talked about here, that you see in the original language, develops a oil that is extremely clear, it's extremely pure, it's free from any kind of debris, and it produces a, a flame that smoked, very little smoke comes off the flame of the kind of oil that the Lord is asking for. 
Now the phrase at the end of verse 20 says that the people of Israel are to bring this oil so that the light may be kept burning. In other translations, we're told that it it's burns continuously. Some commentators uh, think that the lamps in the sanctuary were, were burning 24 hours a day, and other commentators think that it was just a period of time every day. But whatever side of the fence you're on there, the, the point is, is that the, the oil that's produced is to give light in the sanctuary on a regular basis. It's constantly there. And the point of the light is to produce light in the darkness. While the people of Israel, with the exception of the priests, never saw the inside of the tabernacle. The people weren't allowed to go into the holy place. They weren't allowed to go into the most holies. But they did bring oil. And so they have before them a constant reminder of what the presence of God meant. What having the tabernacle in their midst meant for them. When they brought the oil to the tabernacle on a regular basis, they knew that the priests would be entering into the tabernacle with that oil to refill the lamps to keep the lights burning. Light in the darkness. That's what drawing close to God does for people. It brings light in the darkness. Have you ever heard of splunking? I kind of like that word. How would you like to be a splunker? Splunking is when people go exploring in caves, right? Imagine yourself, you're a splunker, you're you're exploring a cave and you're in there for several hours, you keep going in deeper and deeper and deeper, and after a, a long period of time, your flashlight burns out. And imagine you're like me and you go on these sorts of things rather unprepared and you don't have a backup flashlight. I don't know if you've ever been down in a mine or in a deep cave, but when you get deep enough, there is no light at all. It's incredibly dark down there. And you've gone through all these twists and turns, and the light goes out, and you have no idea how to get out. Now, you're down there for a while. You're in the cave, total darkness. And then all of a sudden, you see a small light in the cave. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Well, I'll tell you what I would do. I would go towards the light and try and get out of the cave. That's what coming to God does for a believer. Matthew Henry sees in the lamps a representation of the gifts and graces of the Holy Spirit. And I think he's right. I think he's right. When we approach God through the sacrifice of Christ, when we cling to him as our one and only hope, the light of the Holy Spirit fills our hearts and begins to transform our minds. He becomes our abiding light. No matter how dark the world may become, we have the light of the presence of God. And so I'll close with this. Are you living in the light this morning? The light of God's presence. I'll leave you with the words of the Apostle John as he writes this in 1 John. He says, This is the message we have heard from Him and declare to you. God is light. In Him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with Him, yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live by the truth. But if we walk in the light, as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, His Son, purifies us from all our sin. Let's pray. Lord, this is a glorious picture of your presence among your people that we have in the construction of the tabernacle. God, I thank you that these things are fulfilled not in a tent of fabric and fine linen, of posts covered in bronze, of wood laminated in gold, silver, and all the rest, but they point us, Lord, to your dear Son, 
who is infinitely precious and valuable. God, I pray that Christ would be precious in our sight. I pray it in his name. Amen.